In this video, I'm going to show you the easiest way on how you can set up a semantic cache within your application. Instead of responding in seconds, it's going to be responding in milliseconds. Just to break down some of the benefits by using the semantic cache in this particular application. One of the most expensive pieces of an LLM application is the cost of inference. Whether you're using GPT-4.0 or you're using Gemini Pro or if you're using Anthropic, even if you're using some of the cheaper models, at scale, these things can be incredibly expensive. In the case of something like Answer Engine or say something like Perplexity, let's say you've had the query that a lot of people are going to be asking every single day. The way that it's set up in this application is it's not just caching the LLM response, it's also going to be caching the results that I get back from the search engine APIs, such as the sources, the videos, the images, as well as the follow-up questions. I thought this was a perfect example on how you can use something like a semantic cache. One thing I wanted to point out with Upstash, so I'm going to be working on them with some content. Upstash has a ton coming down the pike in terms of their new AI offerings. And they're going to be simplifying a ton of different pieces. This is just one really great implementation of one of the packages that they offer. All that you have to do to set this up, you can go over to Upstash. When you create an index, it's really straightforward. If I just go example vector, and then we select US East. And then from here, one of the unique pieces is you can actually select your embedding model directly within interface here. It will go ahead and select the dimensions for you. And then you can choose the metric on how it measures the distance between those vector relationships. So from there, you can go ahead and select your plan. Here that you have 10,000 updates and 10,000 queries per day. We'll go ahead and select that. And then once that's selected, all that you'll need within the example here is we're going to head on over to the .env. And then we're going to be using both these values within our application. I want to show you how to set this up with the answer engine like I had just shown you, but I also want to show you a basic example on how to set this up. If you go over to VS Code, now that we have our vector database all set up, we can go over to VS Code. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to go ahead and create a new project. I'm just going to bun init dash Y. And within here, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to create a DNV. I'm going to go ahead and paste in our environment variables. And once you have that done, you can just go ahead and close this out. So now that we have our environment variables all set up, all that we have to do is we have to install a couple packages here. So you can just go ahead and grab those scripts here. And we're going to npm install. You could also use bun if you'd like. We're just going to paste in the instructions from the readme here. And then we're going to also expand this out a little bit now that we have like all the stuff that we need to get started. All right, so now that we have our code set up, I'm going to run through exactly what's happening here. So once you have it set up, it just works. You don't need to manually paste in any more strings or anything like that. This is just going to work for you. If you go ahead, you can test it right off the bat before we run through what exactly the code is doing. If we just go ahead and run the script here, first thing that we're going to do is declare the index of where our index for the vector database is pointing to. And from there, within our semantic cache, we're going to be passing in that index. And then we're also going to be declaring the minimum proximity for it to return a cache. It, essentially how this works is you can think of it as the relatedness between two items. If you think zoo animals and you think about a tiger and you think about a lion, those two items are going to have a much closer semantic similarity than if you said something like a Toyota or a Tesla or a type of car or something like that, right? So cars would be grouped together within that semantic similarity. Essentially what embeddings are doing is it's going to take the similarity and group particular items and queries in this case that are close to one another. In this case, if we're asking what's the controversy with that sky voice, that OpenAI released. What it's going to do with that is it's going to essentially plot that. You can almost think of it as a three-dimensional box. It's going to plot it somewhere within that box. And then for any subsequent queries, when we go ahead and we do that lookup within our vector database here, it's going to go ahead and see if there's any that are above this threshold. So you can play around with the proximity. If you want it to be a little bit more strict, you can dial this up. Or alternatively, you can just turn it down as well if you'd like. Within the example here, this is a simplified example of what I showed you on the outset of the video. The way that this works is for the semantic cache, what we're doing is we're going to be embedding this line here. This is going to be sent to that embeddings model. Once it's returned, it's going to be stored within our vector database here. Once we have that item stored within our vector database, we can look up that key and then it will return that result that we have set here. The other benefit of this is it can make the output a lot more deterministic. There are also some drawbacks. So if you're caching things that aren't a good response, you're going to have to make sure you have a mechanism to actually clear that response, or presumably you'd likely want to set something like that up. 
But the benefits of having something more deterministic is it's more predictable. And then it gives you the ability to save on the inference cost as well as any other API cost. And then it also gives you that improved speed as well, which is obviously really nice. So next we have this synthetic delay. So what this is for is to essentially allow for time for that embeddings to be created and it to be stored within our vector database. And once we have that all set up, next what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, what is Turkey's capital? And since it's going to be similar to this, it's going to return with the result Ankara here. Here we just have a simple delay function, that's our helper function, and that's essentially how it works. If I break down what we're gonna be setting up in just a moment within the answer engine project, within this first argument here is we're gonna be setting that input that the user puts in as our first argument. And then for the second argument, we're gonna wait for all of those responses to come back. We're gonna have all of the sources, we're gonna have the images, we're gonna have the photos, we're gonna have all of the LLM response, and then the follow-up question, as well as whether there's function calls that are invoked. What we're gonna do at the very bottom of our last response there after the follow-up question is we're just going to JSON stringify all of that payload. And it's actually not that big. In terms of the payload that we're going to be saving within the database, it is a relatively light load and it comes at the trade-off of being significantly cheaper as well as considerably faster. I'm going to dive into setting this up within the answer engine itself. So everything I am about to show you, you can go ahead and pull down from the LLM answer engine repo, which I'll link within the description of the video. You can just head on over to the project. If you're not familiar, there's also some other videos that you can check out if you're interested. Now within the repo, what you'll need to set this up within the answer engine, you will need to install both the upstash vector rest URL as well as the upstash vector rest token like you saw in the previous example and grab it from the upstash console like you had just seen. The next thing that we're going to do is within the configuration TSX, we're going to add another key of use a semantic cache that you can turn on or off depending on whether you want to use the cache. If you don't want to use this within the LLM answer engine, you can just set this to false and then it will just default to not using it. So first within our action.tsx, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be adding these new imports for both the semantic cache as well as the index from upstash vector. From there, we're going to look within our configuration object like you had just seen, and then we're going to see whether we're going to be using it or not. If we're going to be using it, we're going to be plugging it in here. And then just like you saw in the previous example, you can change the minimum proximity and this is how you pass in your index and all of that. Where we are referencing the semantic cache on the back end within our action.tsx, what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be having a condition that wraps these pieces but just to make it easy and flexible so you can turn it off, you can turn it on. If you want to just test some things without it on, it gives you some flexibility without having to go into the code and actually have to replace things. The first thing that our action is doing is we're going to be checking whether the rate limit has been met. That's going to be the very first condition as soon as our server action is invoked. Immediately after that, assuming the rate limit isn't met, we're going to check that user message to see if there's a semantic cache hit. And if there is a cache hit, we're gonna go ahead and stream that cache response back to our client. Once we have that set up, we're gonna be running through the my action function where we're gonna be setting up a few different things within that. And then we're gonna be declaring this new clear semantic cache button, which you'll be able to click on the front end and that will be a way that you can invalidate the cache and just delete that vector storage. The reason I wanted to include that is let's just say you have a query that returns a bad message from the LLM for whatever reason. This will ensure just in case we have a bad response, we're just gonna have a simple click where anyone can click and then from there, it will just invalidate the response and then the subsequent message will avoid that cache and then generate it fresh from the LLM and the sources and all of that and whatnot. To circle back on what our action's doing, first we're doing a rate limit check if you're using rate limiting. And then immediately after that, we're gonna be checking to see if we're using that semantic cache. We're gonna go ahead and get the user message and we're going to see whether there's a semantic cache hit. If there is a cache hit, what we're gonna be doing here is within our cache data, we're gonna have the whole JSON payload that renders that entire view. That's gonna be how it generates all the different sources, the response, the follow-up question, the images, the videos. The nice thing with this is it's not just the LLM response that it's caching. There's a couple different LLM calls within the response of the message, the follow-up questions. There's also the API keys for the search engine APIs, for the images, videos, and then the search queries themselves. So that's gonna be one of the nice things with how this is set up where you're just gonna be able to stream everything of all the results back.
We could skip through most of the streamable portions. It's pretty straightforward. We're just going to be sending in all the different results as they come back to us to the front end. If we just go down to the bottom, what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be creating an object called data to cache. And within this object, we're going to have all of the different values of what we're going to be storing within our semantic cache. And then this is going to be the line that actually invokes the method to set up and declare our semantic cache. We're going to have the user message, and then we're going to have this payload that we stringify and store. So the last couple of things that we're going to be setting up within our action.tsx is going to be the button to clear our server cache. We're going to have a very simple server action where we're just going to be passing in the string of the user message. And then if that button is clicked where this method is invoked, we're going to go ahead and delete that message from our semantic cache. So we don't have those bad results if that's the case, or maybe there's just a result that you don't like, or you want to hear it in a different way, whatever it might be. This is going to be the method that we use to actually invalidate that cache. Since we are using the Vercel AI SDK within your actions here, you can add that method that we had just declared above within the actions there. So now once you have that, the lion's share of the work is done. All that we really need to do to set this up on the front end is essentially parse that payload that we're getting back from our semantic cache from Upstash. If it does match that type of cache data, we're going to parse that JSON payload. And then as soon as all of these different parts are parsed, it's going to go ahead, put that in state, and then it's going to render it on the screen for us. And there's also support for those conditionally rendered UI components. If you happen to capture the video where I covered function calling, this is essentially that part as well. There's a couple other minor pieces to set this up on the front end. It's basically going through and setting up all of the different interfaces to make sure that we do have those relevant keys and that it does satisfy what we need for using it within TypeScript. Now, the last thing I wanted to point out is within our LLM response component, we have this new prop that we're passing in of semantic cache key. Within our LLM response component, all that we're really gonna be adding here is that we're gonna have the ability to clear that semantic cache. We're gonna be adding just a couple things within our LLM response component. We're gonna have that button to actually clear the cache, which is gonna be at the bottom of the response container. Then there's also gonna be just a really simple modal that pops up if you've actually clicked it. So as soon as you click it, we're just gonna have a really basic method that will just show that the user message is being cleared and invalidated. Now, in terms of the button itself, you can just see here, we have the button, you can name it whatever you want. I just named it clear response from cache. And then we're handling that clear cache method that we had put here. And then that will fire this handle clear cache here. And then that's gonna be where we pass in our semantic cache key. That's it to get set up and running. So in the video, you saw a really basic example on how to get started and hopefully get comfortable with using it. And then by the end of the video, you have a bit more of an advanced use case on how you can leverage this package. But I just wanted to show you another tool within the toolkit on how you can make your LLM more performant, make it cheaper, make it more reliable, make it more deterministic. And I wanted to thank Upstash for allowing me to collaborate on this content to allow me to showcase you this great work and how you can leverage it within your application. That's it for this video. If you found this video useful, please like, comment, share, and subscribe. Otherwise, until the next one.